Time for another shoegazing podcast episode. Time for another question and answer special. I'm Jesper Ingevaldsson of shoegazing.com, one of the largest blogs in the world on quality shoes. And with me to answer questions from you listeners, we have Daniel Wigan of Catella Shoemaker. This is the second Q&A special with Daniel. The first one was really popular, so we thought we'd do another round. For those who don't know, Daniel Wigan is a Swede living in Kettering, Northampton in England, since many years. He used to work for the bespoke department of Gaziano and Girling, but a few years ago he left to start his own brand, Catella. Worth mentioning as well is that he won the World Championships of Shoemaking in 2019. We go through a bunch of topics in this episode. For example, we talk about the differences between working at a bigger firm and running his own brand, about the challenges to find good leather, about the use of modern technology in shoemaking and much more. So enjoy your listen. All right, uh, Daniel Wigan of uh, Catella Shoemaker. Welcome once again to the Shoegazing Podcast. Thank you, Jesper, for having me back here yeah. at the Shoegazing Podcast. <laughs> yeah, we're actually uh, at home at my place now in Gothenburg. You're out on a trunk show tour. Uh, yeah, it's it's the never-ending trunk show tour. Yeah, because you've that, been traveling a lot lately, right? Yeah, we've. Uh, I tried to... Um, do my best at fitting people frequently and get them through my lengthy, extensive fitting process yeah. <laughs> um, and the catch up. Still a lot of post COVID catch up to yeah, do exactly. mm-hmm. and a lot of new clients after COVID. So try to take care of everybody. And um, now I think we're finally getting to the point where we do more shoemaking than traveling and fitting. So it's very, very exciting. Real shoes. Yeah. It's nice to be a, be a shoemaker for a living and not a traveling shoe salesman for a living. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a bit more of a normal shoemaker life and business now. But that's the thing when you're, when you're in completely new brand, you have to have that ramp up. Yeah. When, when the fitting process usually takes one year and most of your clients uh, ordered one year ago, there, there is not so many, there's only one way about it. So yeah. final now the time has run its course and hopefully we'll be delivering shoes that live up to people's expectations Yeah, cool. in 2023. <laughs> Cool. We're going to do a Q&A special again. Questions and answers. And uh, the questions come from the listeners, uh, mainly on Instagram and some email. And the answers will come from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Feel free to answer if you have a better <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, if my I'm answer just, is boring, uh, have, bring a more colorful answer. <laughs> I just cut you off and yeah, yeah. edit you out, and then I yeah. see you around to myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're gonna start with a question from Mary Mac, and I think this was also a few others who asked similar questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they they want to know if you make everything yourself, and if not, what is uh, done by others, and are those employees or freelancers? So the part that. That I'm most responsible for within the Catella workshop is uh, obviously seeing and measuring all the clients, then making a last and uh, uh, do a lot of the pattern cutting uh, and the shoemaking. Um, I also work with um, uh, Samuel Norsworthy, which is an old colleague and friend of mine from a few years back that's uh, joined the team and uh, in January of this year, 2023. Um, and we together do a lot of the pattern cutting. He will do clicking and closing, which in most cases also include um, one of his responsibilities, which is to source the leather and go to the leather merchants and pick up leather and evaluate each skin's strengths and weaknesses. So 
it's one thing that's quite time consuming and he's I consider I'm quite good at spotting a flaw, but uh, he's done it a lot more. And because he's going to do cut the leather and make the upper, it only makes sense that he looks at the skin as well and can kind of knowing what shoe is going to be cut out of that skin. Yeah. It's easier to kind of imagine where everything's going to fit in. Because he worked uh, for a full time uh, clicker. Yeah. For- so. He, when when we worked together at Cassiano and Girling, his first one of his first jobs in the factory was to help out in the clicking department. So it's probably one of the jobs he's been doing the longest, even before he started training with the pattern cutting and closing in the bespoke department. So he was first a clicker. Yeah. Um, and he also did the clicking at the trickers yeah. for a few years. So he's seen, you know, high-end bespoke shoes and ready-to-wear shoes at G&G and more entry-level and different kind of work environments um, and quality levels with trickers and and so on. Um, And uh, I'm very close to him and his family, so it's it's really nice to work with him again. And he's a, you know, very OCD, uh, picky, perfectionist kind of guy. Works well together with you. Then, yeah, it works really well, and it's he he doesn't have to really think so much about each client, but rather just to do each job to a certain standard. It's it's my job to you know quality control or request things to be one way or another. And and his job to kind of execute to a high standard whatever is required, mm. which he does very well. But, but there's no other like freelancers or anything. No, so I don't use any freelancers now for for anything. Um, you know, every uh, loss making, clicking, closing, making patina, everything is then done between the two of us mm. in the workshop. So. Mm. No, nothing leaves and come back. The only time the shoe leaves is when it's finished to go to the client. And for the shoe trees. Ah, and for the shoe trees. Yeah. So the shoe tree maker will will borrow the shoe and the last yeah. to make a, a tree that fits. Um, so that's done. And you use Hervé Brunel. I use Hervé Brunel yeah, for, for that. He's a, he's a good tree maker. Yeah. All right, from uh, Michal Kuzman uh, and also a few others. Uh, uh, what's the pros and cons between working at uh, Gatsian and Girling uh, mm-hmm. and running your own mm-hmm. brand? Well, with with my own brand, everything is good. And when it wasn't my own brand, everything was bad. No, <laughs> just obviously just kidding. Um, I think when you... When you when you are uh, starting out in the trade, like I did, I think it's almost essential that you work for a different brand. And uh, like when I started at G and G, you know that was like a dream place for me. And I think in many ways it it stayed that way. I felt like because when I started G and G, I just started their own factory. They've only been going since I guess two thousand six, I yeah. think, and I got there in two thousand nine. So. And that it, first year, there wasn't uh, that first their first factory. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. There was, you know, them with the Tony and Dean working from home and doing pretty much only bespoke. With them having a ready to wear range, made another factory. So I was there just a few months. I got there just a few months after they started the factory. So I really felt like, in some ways, like it was mine, or, or I felt like a very personal connection to that company. Mm. And it was really a great journey to see it kind of grow and get investors and have a store. And, you know, all of that was very exciting. Um, And we tried many years to, you know, somewhat kind of successfully to build the reputation of the bespoke and try to do things in house, which is, you know, was very rare and is still very rare today, especially in the British bespoke industry, probably more common in France. Um. Which uh, and I, I'm I'm a firm believer, and I, f- I feel very strongly about in-house production. Why is it's, that? Um, I think just you know, you know, 
the less people are involved, there's there's less, uh, you know, different style. So it helps with consistency and also kind of accountability. Like if, if you go to a firm and the person you see is a loss maker, you know, maybe the upper is made by a person that doesn't know exactly what the customer wanted. They just do to the house style or, and you have a maker that, you know, does something do do like to do things their way and have their style and there's nothing wrong with that style but maybe the customer you know would like it to be a certain way um and sometimes it's hard to communicate that original vision through different craftsmen especially if you don't work together you know it's usually people don't they just do what they're good at and uh, it can create maybe a somewhat kind of generic product one might say and also that depending on what craftsmen are involved you can you know maybe get a a pair that's really good and maybe one that's not as good you know as it could be um yeah sorry i put you off track there but yeah mm. the, dif- mm. ah, the difference the difference between the different between companies the, of yeah, course yeah and pros and cons yeah yeah i think for me the biggest thing is i really enjoy the environment now and uh Gassian and girling had a good work environment but it was more like a factory more people a bit noisier and so on and i i feel like even if you get used to it having that noise is very stressful um uh i feel like my workshop now is more like um it feels more like a home even though it's a workshop um and it's i feel like because i like to work quite a lot i think having that comfortable work environment is very important to, so that you know you're you're excited to go there every day yeah because you have a yeah. pretty new uh, workshop now you, you used to have uh, yeah i used to work from home from home yeah yeah Yeah, but and, now, uh, uh, and during COVID, working from home was almost essential. Yeah. Since I started my business, I think you know, two months before the lockdown and so on, I think um, keeping costs low was essential yeah. for uh, survival. <laughs> and you know, there's always ways to manage, but you know, working from home and not having the cost of a workshop as well was mm. definitely very helpful um and took some of the stress away uh but now i realize with the the success of new clients and so on the the last year or so um it was necessary to to grow a little bit and it was it was quite a t- quick decision just because I, i i a workshop came available that was very suitable for what i was looking for and so i kind of made the made the leap and um bit the bullet so to speak and <laughs> opened my wallet <laughs> uh and and moved in yeah. and uh it's one of those things that it's you know after you do it it's like well why shouldn't why didn't i do this a long time yeah, ago yeah. you know but i think usually these things happen at the right time and uh, once you know it's a good idea you wish you had it a bit earlier but um now having that separation between work and the discipline that leaving your home to go to work creates um, has really changed um, the way i make shoes and shoes is everything i do so i guess it's like changed my life in a way in a very positive way Mm -hmm. and that in combination with you know working with someone else that i respect and and having that person come to work every day kind of makes me i have to be disciplined if, if i want someone else to show up in the morning i gotta show up in the morning <laughs> so uh it's it's create a good uh, routine yeah. and i think you know i think most of us need some kind of routine in life and yeah, this, this when you really... work from home and you put in hmm. work late at night and then yeah postpone things in the morning your yes. your uh, your private life and your work life mm-hmm. kind of bleed into each yeah. other and kind of you know sometimes both parts of your life suffer for it and obviously in some ways it can be really lovely as well mm. um but i think most people during covid experienced working from home in one yeah. way or another and probably can probably relate to the things we we are discussing here about the pros and cons yeah. and um yeah at the moment i'm very excited about the workshop i'm excited about expanding the 
with the team with Samuel and um, so far it's I'm, I'm very proud of the shoes I've been making and and clients seem to like them and order more shoes so yeah it was obviously the right decision even though it um, you know you have to get used of used to being an employer and the added cost of having you know all these uh, things that are good for you yeah. uh, but I, I, li- I like the pressure I have to I have to be not just um, a shoe romantic but a productive shoemaker <laughs> and I love finishing shoes even though it's I feel a lot of pressure to do really well but uh, no I'm, I'm, it's it's good I love the shoes now yeah. and uh, I think uh, the difference now between working for Gassiano and Girling, I think it was not, not so much a difference between the two companies, but also sometimes you need a change in your career to get keep you excited. You need it not to be better, but just to be different. Yeah. Um, and after working at Gassiano Girling for 11 years, I felt like I kind of served my time there. Um, and I felt like the direction that the company was going was probably not something that I would be feel as at home in. So I think for them, for G and G to be the company they want to be, and for me to be the shoemaker I want to be in the future, I think you know you, it, it's better that you you go separate ways. Yes. You know, like um, like people, sometimes you grow apart, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's better to it's easier to stay friends uh, if you. Do you do the, do your follow your each dream of your own? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. A question from Carl. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the industry about the increasing challenges to find good leather. Um, so how, how do you experience this, and uh, how do you think it will be in the future? Yes. It is. It is definitely a challenge. You know, all 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 leather that's not exotic leather. Um, leather that is a cattle or a pig or it, it's all a byproduct of the meat industry there's no real there's not it's it's meat production not skin production <laughs> so the what the meat industry wants that's how the animals are raised and it often wants animals that grow quicker grow larger um and, and lots of other things, maybe you know the way the animals are kept uh, can uh, affect uh, the quality of the leather as well. But I think the biggest issue is um, the, how 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 large and how quickly the animals grow, which create growth marks, um, su- very superficial blood vessels in the skin, and, and things that are considered flaws and undesirable in our the shoes for leather for our shoes. Um, and until the way we keep the animals and how we want them to grow change, the leather is going to be like this. Um, I think the most positive change, which I could see a future for is because I think a lot of people, you know, are looking for a more, if you want to call it, please pardon my vocabulary, but like more ethical animal Mm. racing. Um, that are maybe allowed to, you know, eat eat what they should eat and grow at a more uh, natural pace, I think would be healthier for the animals, healthier for the land that the animals are kept on. And a, a byproduct of that would probably be skins that have um, less of the issues we just mentioned. And um, the problem with this is uh, cost. Yeah, If you want... Uh, the racing keeping animals like this is going to cost a lot more money so the money the somebody has to pay for it so the people that buy the meat from these animals are going to have to be willing to pay more the skin is probably going to pay going to cost a lot more and as a as a buyer of quality leather on a very regular basis i i can i definitely wouldn't consider good leather to be cheap mm. But maybe it has to be more expensive to be better. And uh, if people are willing to pay for it, you know, everything has a price. If somebody wants to pay a certain amount of money for it, probably produce it. But at the moment, I don't really know who this is because most of 
ethical, if you want to call it, or natural leather is more, even more flawed. <laughs> and uh, are usually cattle and not calf. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they're and kind of... Even if you have sort of a nice base, so to speak, mm-hmm. but a lot of the things that we, at least in the dress shoe world, yeah. value highly, which mm-hmm. is clean and not any marks and stretch marks and yeah. and stuff like that. You know, we... But but what is what is desirable in the world of if you want to call it high end shoes or bespoke shoes, you know, probably you know, high end ready to wear have the mm. same problem yeah. as I do. Um is that um we we want skins that are flawless. That's what the customer wants, that's what we present to the customer as what we provide for them. So if that's what we promise, that's what we have to deliver. Mm. Uh, if we tell them that oh, these skins look like this and they have growth marks and the customer says, oh, yes, that's exactly what I want, then we would not have a problem. Yeah. Um, but if you want the kind of flawless nature of these skins is per definition rare, hence they are desirable. Mm. Um, but I still like, you know, just a few months ago, I went to pick up some skins and uh, some of the skins I picked up was, was of an absolutely wonderful quality mm. and definitely not an anomaly <laughs> that they were like, I was like, wow, is this like, is there something wrong here? Because there's like almost no growth marks. I could like make like lots of shoes or huge shoes out of this with no flaws. So I got a couple of skins like that, but then, you know, the next batch is back to normal with the, the where you struggle to get like one good pair out yeah. of these, uh, you know, crust hides. And I also heard that uh, especially some of the larger French uh, tanneries that mm. they've sort of stopped supplying a lot of, especially smaller customers mm. and they sort of mm. uh, keep things tighter and mm. long waiting times and that type of thing i'm not sure how much you are affected by yeah it. it's not something that i noticed i know maybe it's more on a tannery level because i usually work with um like um uh, merchants yeah. in the northampton like your leathers or a crack mm. or something like that so Maybe this is something more that they have to deal with as a buyer directly from the tannery. But yeah, it is a huge problem. And I know that also the shoemakers have the biggest or probably the more demanding client because the the lasting, the stretching, it reveals a lot more issues than just keeping the leather flat. So Mm -hmm. I think if you're a bag maker, a small leather goods, you probably don't experience these issues as much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why you see mm. nowadays mm. there's a lot of more finishing also on the yeah. full green leathers, yeah. which works fine, like you say, for a handbag. But when yeah. you pull it over once last, you once you pull mm. it and some of that grain pulls out, mm. there's a lot of sins being mm. revealed. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I I can understand the tannery because like they don't they don't want to produce they don't want to provide an an in- inadequate product but they are are limited by the raw material available to them so you know if they could if they could get perfect skins they would they would buy them yeah i'm sure and just you know slap whatever price they need to mm-hmm. on them to make a profit but it's just the fact that uh, skin comes as a byproduct it's not if if the animals were raised for skin quality i'm sure the skins would look very different but also cost a lot more mm. um but and you know maybe in the future you know it's obviously the, like lab grown leather yeah, and stuff like that think about those i'm sure in theory it works but i would imagine like commercially it would be very expensive at this point yeah but, but obviously anything in any any tech, technology or or method in its infancy is going to yeah. be very expensive yeah. if you can scale it sure so maybe that is the future like nobody would be happy if i could have all the characteristics of the finest leather grown into whatever shape i want in the laboratory you know every you know and probably maybe design some of the characteristics yeah. almost like you know manipulate it to be even you know a better leather amazing i'm not so personally i'm i only care about really that it's good yeah i don't 
I'm if if I can, you know, nobody will call the meat industry, uh, you know, an industry without issues. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you can avoid some of the problems with the keeping animals and still provide this amazing material which leather is yeah. because it is truly amazing like how it how it functions yeah. is incredible and you know what we today call vegan leather and it, it's 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 just uh, plastic yeah. you know and it, you can call it whatever but you know these alternatives are not really alternatives they are cheap replacements yeah, yeah, exactly. or, I think the only proper uh, alternative theoretically is mm. the grown leather so to speak that yeah where you have exactly the same characteristics like i am i am very happy to admit that i know not a lot about this you know industry mm. or experiments but you know in theory it's uh, it could be wonderful mm. like you could <laughs> I don't even have to lost it. You can just grow it the size shape of a shoe. You know, maybe this would be a very good thing. <laughs> no, it's difficult because mm. this at the same time you want the natural product that leather yeah. is in there. Yeah. I have a hard time myself to because like you say, mm. the meat industry, a lot of shit going on there. And uh, yeah. Uh, could you avoid that to a certain degree? Mm. Still get the same great stuff. Yeah, and I, I found it be interesting. I'm not against it. Like I would love to see what that um, what they would look like. I don't want to dismiss it without knowing anything. Mm. I only know that it in theory it can be done. Do I have experience making any shoes with it? No, I don't. So how how, how can I be negative? But I know that there's a lot of problems with natural leather. So let's see, maybe this mm. is, and maybe it's just, it's just part of the solution. You know, mm. I, I don't want to replace anything. If you can, you know, there there's room for everything, even, mm. even uh, vegan leather, but not necessarily in my kind of shoes, because mm. I wouldn't want to spend so much time and, and effort on a product that won't last, which at the moment, the alternatives don't. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Wartimer uh, asks, what is the most difficult part of the shoemaking process to you? I think you know, getting through the whole thing with uh, getting through the whole process and, and everything being the way you intended, you yeah. know, but I, I would, I would, you know, to simplify the answer, I would say probably the fit part, getting every type of client's expectations as far as what they like to see in the mirror, how they like their shoes to feel, how they imagine that maybe, you know, if they're buying their, fir their first pair of bespoke shoes, what are the expectations? And if those expectations are realistic and on par with uh, what I deliver, how do I, you know, get as close to that or, you know, as possible? Um, that can be very difficult because mm. that's that's the part that's not kind of repeatable because if you know how to stitch in a straight line you kind of know how to stitch in a straight line but uh, you know how you like your shoes to feel yeah. is different from who the next guy and it's mm. anything from you know personal cultural um age everything and you can and have the exact same measurements but com yeah completely different you can have two two feet well yeah. two customers that me measure very similar and you you end up making them two very different losses yeah. and they both fit according to them and me probably mm -hmm. i probably wouldn't say that i think you like it and i think it's terrible and uh, it's just two different flavors you know so we try to you know provide everyone with their favorite flavor <laughs> of fit yeah. and i think that that's very hard to you really i feel like you only really get there by experience and and the, and the experience part does take a long time because mm -hmm. you know you're not making new clients last every day you're making only so many a year and every time i talk to last makers that I consider experienced and do a good job. I feel, feel like most of them would say that, you know, 10 years is kind of the sweet spot where things really start to like fall into place mm. and you have encountered enough different types of feet to know how to treat all of them mm. quite well. 
because you can maybe just because you know how to solve one person's problem doesn't mean you have the solution to every other problem that you might encounter so you need you need time and and a lot of opportunity to see di- to 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 face different challenges for you to learn how to deal with them and mm. i think that that that's very difficult and also very difficult to kind of put in a book you know or just tell somebody oh yeah when you see a toad that looks like that do this you know (laughs) so you just uh it's it's the most um, i would say it's the most mysterious part you know which is a lot of the other stuff you can kind of make into theory yeah Yeah. i understand Mm. um thanos korkunikitas uh, and a few others uh ask similar questions uh they want to know because Many bespoke shoemakers, um, they started offering made to order and made to measure options, Mm. Uh, some even ready to wear, but Mm. that's more rare, I guess. Mm. Um, Often made slightly simpler, but still to high standards. Um, So is this anything you contemplated? Um, It's not something that I've been contemplating, but it's something that I get asked fairly frequently, whether it be, you know, on uh, on Instagram, I get occasionally get messages. They say, "Hey, I love your shoes, but I'm not necessarily looking to buy bespoke. Whether it be the cost involved, or you know, access that they live in a part of the world which I don't travel, and they don't travel to where I go, and so mm-hmm. on. Uh, but they still love my shoemaking, which is very flattering. Um, but uh, I think if, if if I hadn't worked in a company like Gassiano Girling that have a ready-to-wear factory and made-to-order production and know how much work it is to manage that in quality control, and um, I probably would have been tempted because it does seem like a very logical step and obviously something that you can kind of scale a bit more. Yeah, exactly. So. You know, I don't want to call it easy money because I know it's not, but it's it's something that could earn money for the business while you're not making yeah. the shoes yourself. And so you don't have to have your own factory. I mean, no, exactly. You don't have to have your own factory. But I think even if you don't have your own factory, it takes a lot of time to to quality control and also if you if you are interacting with the customers buying these shoes it, it's pretty much a full-time job to run a made-to-order business i'm sure you know what a uh, little bit of working yeah. in the shoe industry yeah. yourself and uh, my main goal is still to accomplish as much as i can and progress as a bespoke shoemaker and it, i it would be too much of a distraction and at the moment i'm not i'm not too uh, I don't see, I don't find it exciting. Yeah. Um, I, it doesn't appeal to me to, to make shoes that aren't as good as my bespoke shoes. Um, because they're not, (laughs) they are more, they are not bespoke fitted. They are obviously depending on who makes them and what factory, but usually they have to be made quicker to hit the price point that you want to offer people. And um, I I try to make the best shoes I can. Hopefully what I would, I would love to be considered to make one of the better shoes in the world, if that's possible one day. Um, and uh, I think that trying to build, expand other parts of the business would take away from that. I know that, I know the hours I work now and I would find it very challenging to squeeze some more hours out of a day. Yeah. So if this, if, you know, I guess you can have, um, a, someone else would manage it for me, but I don't want to, I don't want to build a brand, you know, even whether I want, I might, whether I want to or not, but this is not the goal to build a brand that it, expands a range of products and i don't want to have to have um, less people uh, less problems yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. i have enough problem with uh, myself 
<laughs> no need more to manage. Exactly. I, I, I tried the quality quality control myself. <laughs> That's enough. Uh, Bobby Nanglas uh, yeah. asks, have you thought about adding modern technology such as 3D printing or scanning, for example? Yeah, I, I you know, I think... Um, It's a bit of a, I might be a bit of an oddball in this industry, but I do find these things quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I definitely don't. I think what I see from the the little experience I have with uh, owners or entrepreneurs within, should we call it digital shoemaking if, or online <laughs> shoemaking or whatever you want to call it. I think at the moment people try to, by what whether it be a combination of software or so hardware and software and fix every problem mm. and make the fantastic shoes in a really affordable way and i don't i well i would argue i know for a fact that at the moment it's not able to achieve this because i have yet yet to see this result and i also know some of the people running these businesses and and i know that they are not able, they would not say that they are able to uh, achieve I've this. I've tried quite a few of these uh, companies myself. Mm. And yeah. The yeah. It isn't there yet. yet no, honestly. because I think like any technology, you know, you got to crawl before you can walk. And at the moment they, they, they try to skip the crawling stage. <laughs> uh, so whether it's, it's a little bit too optimistic for me, And maybe that comes from wishful thinking or they are just maybe naive, but it's almost like if we just uh, have a, a good uh, software developer, we don't even need to talk to a shoemaker because this will do everything. <laughs> Basically scan foot, press uh, print last and mm. uh, you make uh, the best shoes in the world. And, and this is a problem. Um, I quite enjoy, I, uh, I work with people. Sometimes I make women's shoes and I might have a client that has uh, a loss that she's very happy with, but says, okay, next time I would like a, a heel that's one inch higher. And uh, in those cases, I will uh, 3D scan the last, change the heel height in, and not me personally, but uh, um, a CAD somebody with the skills with yeah. CAD and it can, and I've, I've, I've you had the, a few different people do it. And sometimes certain lost factories like Springline and mm. Spenle, they're able to do this. If you ask you, ask them to do it, that you can say, okay, I, this lost f fits really well. I don't want to, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So let's keep everything that's right here. And we keep this lost the way it is, but could we make a modification? make a modification um so that it same loss but one inch higher heel and then they can change that digitally mm -hmm. and, and make me a lost and it's uh, from my experience it's been it's worked very well and uh i i have uh visited places that use 3d scanning and i was actually i felt really proud once that when um They scanned my foot and I compared it with my measurements, measuring myself. It was like, a, you know, a tenth of a millimeter accuracy almost. I felt like I was almost, you know, I felt really proud that I was as good as the machine, yeah. not, not the other way around, you know. Yeah, I think you have yeah, had you check uh, a mm. scan on my feet and compare yeah. it to your measurements, but it was also yeah. very equal. Yeah. So that... That doesn't seem to be the problem. No. To get the data correctly. Yeah, I think the problem is if you go straight digital. from scan into the computer seems to be quite problematic mm. when I think if there was a last maker feeding the adjusting the last, if they if the last if you have a good last maker that knows how to use CAD and use how to apply the measurements taken from the scan, I think it would be as good as anybody that knows how to use any tool. Mm. Like it's just a tool. Mm. It's just, it doesn't do the job for you. You still have to do the job. Um, and you also have to ideally have the last maker see and feed your feet and talk to you. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like 
I want, you know, you still want to see the client. Mm. Uh, and once you see the client, it kind of makes some of this technology kind of redundant. Um, because a lot of these 3D scanning things, what they try to sell is super accuracy. That is like our scanner is accurate to a tenth of a millimeter. That accuracy is not what's ma- what makes a good last. So I would almost argue you can be a um, couple of millimeters off and ha- have, have a perfectly fitting last. And you can be within a tenth of a millimeter compared to the measurements and depending on where you measure but you know you can be very off so it's 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 still uh, it's still just a tool and up until now i felt i've only seen the tool used poorly but for some things i think it's just a matter of time you know i think i i think um if you would have like an AI kind of system that mm-hmm. would learn how a last maker makes a last for a certain time of foot, I'm sure it could start to see patterns that yeah, you would yeah, do exactly. this and this. And it's like, if he measures here and here and every time does this and it seems to fit well, I'm sure obviously it can learn and, and apply mm-hmm. this. But up until that point, you know, you're still going to need a shoemaker involved for a while yeah. for it to, it's got to learn from somewhere, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's got nobody to learn from, you know, can't figure it out. Yeah. If you, if the artificial intelligence learn from a really lo- bad loss maker, it won't be very good. If you learn from a really good one, it probably have a better chance. Mm. So, but I, I like the idea of, of this technology. And I've actually had uh, a couple of clients that, um, during the pandemic and probably and even now would not go to to Lo- to london to see me and they don't go to america and they go to and are maybe for various reasons not able to travel and access me they've uh, 3d scanned their feet and i have 3d printed their feet here mm-hmm. and measured their 3d printed feet and mm. gotten pretty close i um that's for me that's what i have experienced uh, it's not a service that i would offer because it it's very problematic I was, I was yeah everybody <laughs> don't send me your 3d scan the feet files because i am not taking orders for that yeah. but i've i've uh, i've played around with it yeah. uh, with people that i know mm. uh, and just just to see because i don't want to be uh, left behind i want to i want to know everything about uh, what's happening in yeah. the, this little shoe world and I think the people that are most negative are people that have uh, zero experience of this. And I don't want to be one of those people. But for now, I have I definitely prefer to make a loss by measuring your feet and using a rasp. And, you know, the day when that's not the best way for me to make shoes, I'll have to reconsider. But at the moment, that doesn't seem to be anytime soon. And... um like the measure tape and the rasp in my hands is my tool of choice. Maybe the shoemaker in the future, their tool of choice will be different. And, you know, if they make better shoes than I do this way, you know, they should do it that way. It's more important that shoes are good and clients are happy than whether you use, uh, you know, a computer or your hands. I think the the most important is that shoes, the result is good because that's mm-hmm. what's going to make people excited about high-end footwear you know if you make a bad loss with the rasp and you and the competitor makes a good loss with a computer i know which one i would want (laughs) any day of the week um but for a long time i think it'd be really interesting to see a combination Mm -hmm. like that you and i think if you look at mechanical watchmaking a lot of uh interesting products in the world uh, use a combination i think the biggest people are very intimidated because some of this technology is very expensive and if you're a bespoke maker you use it very little (laughs) and um, it might be you know almost completely redundant before you have even a chance of making any of this money back Mm. so i think there's a lot of economical issues and at the moment the some of the if you want to buy a good 3d scanner good software and a, 
a last making lathe that can turn last from a CAD file, you're looking at a lot of money. <laughs> it's not your <laughs> no, two, no. Uh, <laughs> two, two rasps people, and a vice. Yeah, and, uh, and no, no. Not the two people company that buy these. No, no. It, it's a different kind of industry. Yeah. And I understand the romance about, you know, traditional methods. Uh, and I don't want them to be thrown away because if you throw the traditional loss making away today and replace it with a computer, you're going to have a lot of problems. <laughs> so, you know, there's room for both. Mm. Um, and I think in the future, it'd be great to see them coexist. I talk with people that are in, in similar industries that are kind of considered craft industries where using technology is quite controversial. But uh, usually once you, if the technology is used correctly and keeps what's great about craft while elevating it to uh, something that satisfy, have higher customer satisfaction, uh, it, 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 gets, it soon gets accepted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if people are happier, uh, you know, people's sa customer satisfaction is, is key. Mm -hmm. So... This is a bit of a complicated question, but I think <laughs> you will understand uh, yeah. more than me. But uh, mm. this is from Leo, mm. uh, and uh, uh, he has a question on good range, uh, the term good range. Uh, he, he heard you talk about it at an independent shoemaker, shoemakers conference a while ago. Um, so, so first, what what is good range? Well, the, this is it's funny that this question comes up because I think when I had this lecture, most of the people listening they haven't really heard this term either. Yeah. But it's it's something that really caught my eye when I was reading some old shoemaking books that they use this term terminology range, and and good range and poor range, uh, fairly frequently in lots of various situations, but. Basically, what it refers to is like different parts or shapes of the shoe flowing together in a harmonious way that they kind of look like they are intentional, harmonious, uh, clean looking. So, you know, if you have a welt, does it look like a roller coaster or is it flat, you know, and does the seat of the heel blend with the waist? So if everything is straight and harmonious, that would be good range. If it's, you know, a bit squiggly line, uh, not very straight, then the heel doesn't really blend with the waist and it's kind of an awkward, they look like separate parts, like they don't mm. really belong together. That would be considered poor range. Um, and even, you know, maybe bad skiving could give poor range that you get a bump you yeah. know rather than mm -hmm. a smooth so it's a it's still to me fairly a mysterious term but i i feel like what they what they were referring to is something that i think is very important and sometimes it might be something that people respond to that they like when they see it but they don't know that that's what it's called or even that that's what they like about it that they just see a this shoe looks nice and clean and perfect and you know it could be argued that the what they like about it is that good range um so yeah that's what okay. that's what i would that's, that's what the, i use it for yeah i see uh, cool because then uh, he continues that um uh, He says, there are many make new makers coming to the market, for example, from Vietnam and China, uh, who output uh, aesthetically pleasing shoes. Uh, based on the business model, training of the makers, and I guess personal objectives, these makers don't conform to good range yet, he says. Mm. So how, how do you see the future of shoemaking evolving and how, how can shoemakers like you or Patrick Frey mm -hmm. and... Uh, those who clearly continue the legacy mm -hmm. of high-end shoemaking, uh, how can you distinguish yourself, especially considering the good range yeah. or attention to detail that mm -hmm. are both things that customers usually won't notice easily? He says. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer this uh, uh, very strange question yeah. or because I think what, what, what the, the person asking the question is saying that, you know, 
people, younger businesses from other areas with um, various experience, you know, almost wouldn't have their shoes wouldn't have good range, which I don't see a reason why they couldn't have good range. You know, if, if you, if you stitch straight and make things and I, it doesn't matter if you made shoes for 10 years or 40 years, I think I always, when I held my lecture, I just, the reason I brought it up was because I thought that it was very helpful for me to think of it as something that I tried to achieve. So if I thought about good range as something I wanted to create, it makes it, it makes it easier for you to make it if you know that that's what you're looking for. Um, so I, I brought it up and I brought up examples of what I think good range is. Um, and like, like the, the, like the question says, I, I don't really think that that's a problem. Like there's nothing about me as a shoemaker compared to any other shoemaker that would make me able to have my shoes to have good range and theirs wouldn't. I don't really understand the question no, there, <laughs> but maybe I can answer the question like what's important to develop, yeah. you know? And I, th I think it's for any shoemaker, I think it's important that your shoes have good range regardless of your experience level or, you know, uh, what part of the world it's from or, or, or anything like that. Um, and how do you achieve it then? How, how do you learn to achieve good range? I think it's just preparation or uh, having that as an aesthetic goal that you want harmony rather than maybe if you think of the soul as one piece rather than the heel waist and the forepart as separate parts i think that will automatically make you blend them better rather than you just look at the heel and then you look at the waist and then you so if you observe the shoe as a whole you if you if you stand back and look at it and observe it from different angles i'm sure you will find an area that is like mm, this doesn't look right or this looks a little bit um like a lumpy or bumpy or whatever you want to call it, or not a straight line that you want it to be straight. If you, if you look for those areas and try to address them then, and, and learn for them to prepare things more the right way or a better way for the next pair of shoes, I think you will get closer to this, this aesthetic, if mm. you want to call it. But yeah, it is a bit of a my mysterious term, but, I think the end of that question, I feel like you could you could answer a different way. Like, what's the what's important for the future of of shoemakers to create a, a desirable product? And I think you should um, you you should you know try to try to make beautiful shoes that people are comfortable and excited to wear. Like that's the only thing that matters. Mm. Like if you, if shoemakers can do that, they have a future. If they don't do that, it doesn't matter if they, you know, use, use technology or ancient methods or, you know, yeah. ju just high SPI and high SPI, you know, a lot of these things that we are very, we love to talk about and, you know, brag about yeah, I mean, maybe. I'm very guilty of that. Yeah, yeah. But sure, no, so. it's it's part of our community yeah, yeah. and it's it, you know, sometimes it's nice to just have like a spec sheet, you know. Yeah. You know, I think um and it's fun. It's also I think a phase of every shoemaker apprentice's journey that you have this period where you like you love the tiny stitches and you want to do it super small. And uh I think if you do that for a long period of time and also if you you know, like some people start their own shoemaking company and you realize that if your job is to to make your customers happy, for some people, if th what makes them happy is small stitches, then you should try your best to deliver small stitches for them. If what they what makes them excited and dream about is a specific color of shoe, you should try to do the color of the mm -hmm. shoe. And if you dream about having, uh, you know, your cake and eat it, you want the little stitches and the right color, you know, you, you, tr you try to give as much as you can of what, what they want. Um, and as a shoemaker, I think it's, you should, you should, 
you should try to be as good as you can be at, in as many parts of shoemaking as possible because then you have more tools in you know in your arsenal to 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 for to achieve customer satisfaction mm. um and in the future it's going to be very important for shoemakers to be very good in a lot of different things because i truly believe that the the independent shoemaker is the future of shoemaking mm. Um, it's, uh, there's going to be very few incentives for talented shoemakers to, to work for a brand when with social media, you can find your clients, your clients can find you a lot of the new client of today is a researcher. Many, they want to find the new shoemaker. They want to find the shoemaker that is not known yet, or they want to find a shoemaker and have shoes from a shoemaker that no one else has shoes from yet. Or, you know, it's like the, it's a little bit of a, you know, maybe be a bit, uh, not a modern opinion, but you know, it's a little bit of a male ego thing. You know, you want to have the, the latest, uh, the best, you know, bragging rights, at least some people do, especially the, you know, on the internet, mm. you know, um, and, if you're a very talented shoemaker, I, it, it may, it, I think it makes sense that you, um, to, you can, you can earn probably more money, even if you have to work harder as an independent, cause you don't really have a middleman. It's not, it's only you getting paid, not a whole brand, but it's also a little bit of a shame if the outworker, um, way of, uh, being a shoemaker disappears because just because you love shoemaking doesn't mean you love having a shoe company. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I can understand why somebody would not want to do trunk shows. And, and, and maybe if, maybe if you have a family, this is not even an option that, uh, and you might want to be a shoemaker, even if you live in an area of the world where there's not a market for bespoke shoes and so on. So, but, but I truly believe that the, the best shoes in the future will be made by very small companies. Uh, and it's going to be, and be more, be greater value also. Mm. That's, that's what I believe. But nice. I might be biased. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe if I owned a, a company with lots of outworkers and uh, yeah, yeah, a big, yeah. a lot of, uh, I had a big uh, store that needs yeah. a lot of clients, I would have a very different opinion. But um, I, I, I see a trend of a lot of the people that now buy their first pair of bespoke shoes, they're much more intrigued by the independent. And I think part of that is like, people like you and bloggers that they write about these shoemakers. So it's like maybe you Kirby Allison that give, give shoemakers a voice and give potential clients a opportunity to almost see a little bit of the personality of the person that they might make a commission with. And a lot of people want that quite intimate relationship with their mm. craftsmen and they, uh, there was an article by uh, Derek Guy, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. recently on Die which, Workwear, Die Workwear, yeah, um, which I think kind of touched on this subject. Um, and it's also my experience, and maybe you know, all the clients that go to big houses and are very satisfied with the product, I don't meet so many of those people, <laughs> I only meet the people that maybe were not happy and look for an alternative. But it does seem to be a lot of people what what the big brand offers might be a good service, but it might not be what everybody wants. They probably want more of that personal, intimate uh, relationship with their craftsmen. And that's available now. And many years ago, it was simply not available because where, you know, where would a shoemaker in Kettering like me find a client in uh, Texas, mm. you know, I just go there and nobody knows I'm there, you stand know, on the square and stand wave, on the square and wave, wave my shoemaking flag, <laughs> you know, it would be very complicated. So before you had to almost over time, build up a reputation, word of mouth or have a store in the kind of area where people buy these things, uh, spend their time. 
so yeah it's it's a our our business is going through a change like the how they're made who who buys what from where and i i think it will end up in a very good place the shoes shoes that shoemakers make today in different parts of the world are very high quality and they come and have a very i think a lot of shoemakers have a good attitude towards mm. their client that yeah. they want to make them you know they take great pride and they take uh, responsibility for for their shoes and mm. and you know if you take responsibility and you you have high um, work very hard you you will be a good shoemaker simple as that and that's what i would want from my shoemaker if i was a customer so mm. I think the, f- the future is good. So if people just keep doing what they're doing, the, the future of shoemaking is uh, bright. Cool. We have a question from Giuseppe Davanzo. Um, for those who can't afford your shoes and I mean other bespoke shoemakers, uh, which brands in the $300 to $500 range uh, would you recommend? It's, it's the eternal question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's uh, one of the hardest questions. Um, it 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 depends. I I'm I have to admit that I'm not very well informed. Um, I don't spend a lot of time, uh, and I have a, um, have zero experience in wearing any shoes in that price point. Definitely not recently. You know, the traditional answer would be, you know, uh, you know, your Crockett and Jones and your Carminas and your TLBs and, and, and these shoes. And I always say, try them. If you like the way they look and you like the way they feel, chances are they're going to be a good pair of shoes for you. If 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 on paper they look like a good, <laughs> they have a nice leather and a nice construction, but they're not comfortable on your feet and they don't uh, you don't like what you see in the mirror then, then don't don't buy them you know it's more, more important that they are comfortable and you like them um if one person recommends the shoes try their recommendation see what they're like and you know if everybody writes at a shoe that they bought that they just fall apart and <laughs> i don't know what happens to these shoes but if if people have bad experience then then maybe look elsewhere but i think yeah you there's a lot of people on the internet that have much more experience in in buying and wearing these shoes than mm. i do so yeah. I, i i i'll give it a pass <laughs> you have no secret uh, no i answer. <laughs> no i think because i know that if i was buying the shoes for myself or recommending a friend that's what i would say you know do you like the way they look and the feel that's mm. that's more important that like that's the fun part mm. if they're not comfortable or you don't like the way they look you know it doesn't care if uh, it's uh jammed or good gear welted or like jammed or hands welted or or whatever like you know you want to be comfortable and look good in your your, your nice leather shoes like that's that's uh, that's what it's all about mm. all right daniel wigan of catella shoemaker thank you very much for answering all these questions Thank you, Jesper, and thank you to all the people that asked great questions. Yeah, exactly. And thanks to all who sent in and which we couldn't squeeze in. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening in on this episode. Head to shoegazing.com for much more on quality shoes. And to those of you who want to support shoegazing and make it possible for me to continue to produce high-level content, there is a Patreon page where you can contribute with anything from $3 a month. Both big and small contributions are much appreciated. See shoegazing.com for more info on this. The Shoegazing podcast will be back with a new episode in a short while. In this, we will talk to shoemaker William F. Laborde about connecting historic shoemaking with the present. So, hear you again soon.